Thank you very much. Um, this is a, an area which uh, is, has always been of great interest to me because it is so, it's, it's so variable during the month that it's very important to look at the endometrium uh, very carefully and correlate it with the time of the month that the patient is at or whether or not she's pre- or postmenopausal, because it will tell you a lot. First of all, how many of you still fill, fill, fill bladders for these patients? Anybody? A few? Please don't. It's unnecessary. It's torture. Uh, nowadays, you really, you know, then you, you can't even see anything when the bladder's that full. Um, uh, we really do not fill, fill the bladder. We do a, an abdominal scan just to see if there's anything up above the uterus, and then we do the transvaginal scan that shows us uh, the uterus. And so it is unnecessary to fill the bladders. So antiverted, retroverted, you can see here the endometrium is well seen, and there is this line in the middle right here that uh, indicates that there's absolutely nothing in the cavity. This is where the um, uh, mucosa meets the mucosa, and, and there's nothing uh, in there. Here you don't see it quite as well because we're a little bit further away uh, from the ultrasound beam. But during the menstrual cycle, uh, the endometrium goes through a series of changes. And in the middle of the cycle, when, um, uh, uh, when you ovulate, uh, this is pretty much what you have is the uh, trilaminar um, uh, appearance. Uh, and again, this line is very important because it shows you that there's there is no polyp and, and, or no fibroid inside the cavity. And, and again, here, uh, here it is. And that's an important line um, uh, to look at. Now, as you go on after ovulation, uh, the lute luteal phase, the, my, the endometrium th thickens up and um, actually becomes very, very thick and, and e sometimes even uh, heterogeneous. And so you really can't measure it, or you can measure it, but you, it doesn't mean anything to measure the, my, the, the endometrium after ovulation. And in fact, it really doesn't mean much to measure it at all on premenopausal patients. Part of looking at the endometrium is looking at the endocervix and the endocervical canal. At the same time, you also get to see the cul-de-sac and anything that's going on down there. Uh, but you see very well here the anterior and posterior lip of the cervix and post anterior fornix, posterior fornix right in here, and, uh, and the endocervical canal. The canal, the, the cervix and probably stops here, but it's very difficult to tell exactly where the, cervix, the uh, internal os is compared to where the rest of the uterus starts, and I don't think there's uh, much of a reason to try and struggle to do that. So, there's always a question of what, what the normal width of the endometrium is. <clears throat> and in premenopausal patients, there, there is no number. Uh, it, there is absolutely no number. Uh, what you need to look at is the pattern of the endometrial echo. You know, is it heterogeneous? Does it have something in it, like a polyp or a fibroid? Um, does it have cystic areas in it? Uh, but the actual number itself does not matter. Um, uh, and um, it, it may be thinner if the patient's on birth control pills, but still, I wouldn't get hung up on a number. Now, if the patient is postmenopausal, it, that changes a little bit, uh, and it depends greatly on whether the patient is bleeding or not. If the patient is coming in for postmenopausal bleeding, the number that the most accepted number is less than four. Uh, there is some data out there less than five. Uh, we have switched to less than four because that's a predominance of the data right now. Um, but anything greater than four requires an endometrial biopsy or further evaluation. If the patient is not bleeding, there is no number. Again, there is no number if the patient is not bleeding. Some people have put out eight, ten, whatever. Again, look at the endometrium. And if you're concerned about the texture, of the endometrium, do a sonohistogram, and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's really the easiest thing to do uh, rather than trying to get hung up on a number. So the postmenopausal endometrium, most of the time, is very thin. You can see we've measured the anterior and posterior aspects of the um, uh, endo uh, endometrium. There's a little bit of fluid inside the cavity. That's very common. That's normal. Um, doesn't mean anything. In fact, it's very useful when there's a little bit of fluid because it can outline whatever might be in there, like a little polyp. Uh, so this is completely normal. Um, 
Uh, here's a uh, postmenopausal patient uh, with a small uterus. You can see the uterus is very small. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of fluid in the endometrium. Again, that's normal. Now be careful that when you look at the endometrium, you have to look at the entire endometrium. Uh, you can't just see part of it, measure it, and, and give that number and not have seen the entire part uh, because the other side of it may contain something. Uh, so if you don't see the entirety, then I report it as not well seen. Um, and that's really important. Don't, um, don't be overconfident. Uh, now, polyps are usually pretty well seen even um, when there's no fluid in there. You can actually see a different texture. Uh, uh, echo texture of the polyp itself, uh, and if you add some color, um, it'll even enhance it even more uh, because you'll actually see the feeder vessel going into the polyp. And sometimes, even if you don't see the feeder vessel, we still call a polyp, although it could be a little clot at that point. Uh, but um, the echo texture of the endometrium is really important, and now we have instruments in our ultrasound machines that are so good uh, that we can actually tell a lot about looking at the endometrium, just looking at the texture, uh, rather than getting hung up on a number. Uh, we do a lot of 3D uh, for the endometrium, and uh, uh, in this case, we knew, knew there was a polyp. This shows you exactly where it is. Um, what we do now a lot is we include this picture in the report uh, to the referring physician so that the referring physician knows exactly when they do the hysteroscopy, <clears throat> where to go and where the polyp is. <clears throat> so here is a 67-year-old patient with postmenopausal bleeding. She has a thick endometrium. It's heterogeneous. Um, clearly, there's some fluid in the endometrium. It's dirty fluid, sort of. It's echo, you know, got echogenic material in it. You can see that this is sort of a mass inside here. There's a lot of color. Uh, there's a lot of blood flow, can, color is very important. This is great to endometrial carcinoma. And what's uh, important about the endometrial carcinomas when you see them is how invasive are they? Uh, we decided that this was not terribly invasive because we could still see portions of the endometrium here and uh, we, didn't, we saw some pretty good thick myometrium, and so um, less than 50% invasion indicates that the patient won't need chemotherapy and will be cured uh, by a hysterectomy. And greater than 50% uh, invasion through the myometrium, they will need further treatment. Um, here's a polyp, um, and this was a polyp that uh, you couldn't really tell it was a polyp just looking at this. Uh, but then we turn on the color and you can see that there's a single feeder vessel which suggested that this was all one entity. It was a polyp. There was a lot of blood flow here. Turns out uh, that this was an um, uh, adenocarcinoma of the, um, uh, of inside the polyp uh, uh, in a patient that was bleeding. So polyps can contain uh, cancer. Um, obviously, they don't spread quite as, as, as much, which is good. Uh, but um, if there's bleeding, the polyps have to come out. Here's a 63-year-old with postmenopausal bleeding, and here, it, this is a little more problematic. Now, the back here looks pretty good, okay? There, there's certainly a mass in the uterus. It's echogenic. There's a lot of color. Um, this is bad. This is cancer of the endometrium. But you're missing the borders of the front here, of the anterior wall of the, of the endometrium. And that's worrisome here. And this was, in fact, a 90% a, a invasion with nodes. And so that's bad news for this patient. She will need some further treatment uh, after her hysterectomy. So uh, 3D, as I said, is very, very important uh, in gynecology. We do a 3D on every gynecologic patient that we scan. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it replaces MRI in, in many uh, situations when well, we want to look at the shape of the endometrial cavity, um, certainly for uh, Mullerian duct abnormalities and the like. And uh, how many of you do 3D in your GYN scans? Um, so uh, great, uh, quite a few of you. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, just do it and get used to doing it because uh, as you take your volume and your three orthogonal planes come up, uh, your third plane here, your Z plane, is the money plane where you will see a reconstructed view of the endometrium that you otherwise don't see. Now, going on to uh, spending more time on 
patients with postmenopausal bleeding. Here was a postmenopausal patient. You can see very thin endometrium. Uh, by the way, don't just measure it here. You got to measure it over here because, again, you'd be misleading if you uh, measured it somewhere here. Here, this is not very well uh, seen, so that you really can't put your caliper here. But the measurement is not what counts here. What counts is that there's something inside the endometrial cavity, and so you have to really um, uh, look and see what it is. And it was a little polyp right here inside the endometrial cavity. Now, here's a submucosal fibroid, and if you bring them in at a time when after ovulation in the um, luteal phase of the cycle, the endometrium will be thick enough so that it will act as a contrast and it'll outline uh, the fibroid for you so you don't even have to put any fluid in. And so we do that a lot when patients um, come in uh, for locate localization of fibroids, how much of it is submucosal. We have them come in in the latter part of the cycle as opposed to the early part. Here's another uh, fibroid. It looks completely intracavitary here, uh, but in fact, it's not totally intracavitary. It's probably, I would say, 75% intracavitary. But this is the picture that the surgeon wants. Uh, this will tell the surgeon uh, how much they'll be able to shave off um, hysteroscopically. Now, uh, one thing that is extremely useful when looking at the endometrium is the sonohysterography. Uh, we do, I would say, an average of three to four a day. And they're very, very easy to do. You thread a little insemination catheter up in the endometrium and you just put a little bit of saline. And you outline uh, the cavity. And it shows you if there's any question about whether uh, there was some lesion in the endometrium, it just it shows it to you so much better uh, then you take your volume, you take a couple of quick volumes, and uh, then you can save the volume and you can go back and rescan after the patient's gone because you've got the entire picture. You don't have just a few snapshots uh, of um, the, the fluid going in. The other reason to do 3D is because uh, if, unless you use a balloon uh, catheter, if you use a little insemination catheter, the, the, the uh, fluid will come, come out come pouring out as you put it in, so that you'll have to keep putting saline in in order to get all your pictures. Whereas if you're doing it with 3D, you put your burst of saline, you take a couple of quick volumes, and then you're done. And you don't have to blow up a balloon, which is, um, tends to be more painful to the patient. So here's a patient that clearly has an abnormal endometrium. And again, uh, you can measure it if you want. It's not going to mean anything um, unless she's postmenopausal and bleeding but you still want to find out what's going on in here. And so the way to do it is to put some fluid in. So we put the fluid in, and sure enough, you don't really need the 3D in this case. We, we do it to archive everything. But uh, you can see the polyp right there, and there's a couple of several polyps. Uh, the advantage to doing 3D is that you can get all your polyps um, photographed all at once. Then you can go back and measure them at your leisure without having to keep pu putting fluid in. Uh, but nonetheless, this shows you uh, what, what is going on in here rather than trying to guess. Um, and by the way, if they do an endometrial biopsy here, they probably won't get anything because most of the time uh, when there were polyps, the endometrial biopsy is negative because they miss the polyp. Uh, so uh, it's very important to be able to tell the, the referring physician, these are polyps, you better go in there with a scope uh, because otherwise you're, gonna, you're not going to get a piece of whatever this is. All right, now, can you measure the endometrium in this postmenopausal patient? Well, you might say, sure, I can measure it right here, but that's not good enough because up here you can't tell what's going on. So in this case, even though you can measure it in certain places, I would say, no, I can't measure it. So you put a little fluid in, and lo and behold, look at what we see here, uh, a little, a little, um, whoops, a little polyp right here. So. Uh, we have very low threshold for putting a little bit of fluid. It's really easy to do, and um, uh, it'll outline whatever's going on here. Here's another patient, 43-year-old with menometrorrhagia. Here's the endometrium. Can we see it? Well, sort of, a little bit, you know, but <laughs> we, we really can't. Now let me just show you, go back, and you, you see here, uh, don't invent the endometrium and put a to put a caliper on it. Just, you know, a little bit of fluid will really tell you what it is. You can get fancy with it if you want to send a nice picture the, to the referring physician. This really goes a long way if you send these nice pictures, and they'll send you more patients, which is always very nice. 
And if you take a 3D, you can even make it look like an MRI if, um, if you want by, um, giving, by turning your 3D into a, 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 a slices uh, like a, a other cross-sectional imaging techniques. Uh, these are all techniques to display. Once you have the 3D, you can display it in lots of different ways. You can display it like this. You can display it uh, surface rendering of the polyp. You can display it um, in one volume. You can display it in these two different ways, depending on how you want to manipulate your volume. Uh, so this is very, very useful. All right, now here's somebody, 55-year-old on tamoxifen. And she was sent in because another radiologist felt that the endometrium was thick. Well, you know, what are you going to do here? You're going to measure it from here to there, from here to here, or from out over there to over here? Well, you can't measure it. You, you can't measure it. And not only that, but patients with, uh, that are on tamoxifen, you know, they, they have an increased incidence of, an, a, um, of polyps and endometrial cancer, but they also have uh, subendometrial cysts that can confuse the issue. So the only thing to do here is to put in some fluid, and actually the endometrium is normal. These are all subendometrial cysts, and we were able to tell the patient that uh, the referring physician that the endometrium is entirely normal, and she doesn't even need an endometrial biopsy. Um, if you put some fluid, you'll outline uh, fibroids, and I, I don't want to get in too much to fibroids. Uh, because I know that uh, Mary just, just spoke about them, but the fibroid can sometimes try to deliver itself. It can be very painful to the patient. Uh, here's a fibroid trying to get out of the, through the cervix, um, and you can see that um, uh, there's a stalk here, and if you turn on the color, you will see uh, 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 the blood flow going down uh, from where the origin of this uh, fibroid is uh, trying to get out. And here is this stalk. Uh, they can be quite vascular, but this is a prolapsing fibroid. Okay, now going on to uh, what you can do uh, as, uh, for infertility patients. Um, uh, I know that many of you do um, uh, hysterosalpingograms. Uh, we, have, we do not do them anymore. We do HICOSI, which um, I'm not going to try and say what HICOSI stands for because it's written down here if you are interested in reading, about, reading it. Um, but what it is basically is putting some fluid in the endometrium, doing a sonohistogram, but then um, you blow up a little balloon and then you can um, put a little bit of air. We've used air because contrast wasn't available <clears throat> and air works really well. Uh, you put a little bit of air in the cavity and then it goes out the tubes and it demonstrates the tubes. The, the nice thing about the hycosi is that, first of all, there's no radiation, there's no dye. Um, you can certainly uh, differentiate uterine shape abnormalities um, uh, easily, but uh, in addition to the, uh, uh, the intracavitary lesions, you can see the serosa. It's very important to see the outside of the uterus when you're trying to figure out what um, to correlate what the inside looks like. Plus, all, you can assess the ovaries, uh, the tubes, the, the, the whole thing. So it's really, it's a lower cost. It's a full pelvic examination uh, that doesn't have any radiation. So there's absolutely no reason not to do these. We do about two a day uh, of these. And here is a little bit of air uh, being injected in the cavity right here. You can see a little puff of air. And you can see the air going down the tube right here. Now, it's a quick thing, and you have to have a sonographer that knows what uh, he or she is doing to snap the video right at the right time, um, because it's, it just is a whiff of uh, air, but it does show you the patency of that tube. Um, let's see if I can go on to the next slide. Uh, it's Somehow it's not being... How do you go to the next slide? <laughs> oh, here. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, so if you're lucky, you can actually see both tubes at the same time. Uh, here we were getting fancy, but usually you have to do one tube at a time. Um, but in this case, uh, things were lined up well enough so you could see the patency of both tubes. When the, when the tube is blocked, um, it will well up in here and the patient will be very uncomfortable, will have a lot of cramping. and. Um, and so uh, uh, sometimes you, you, you'll see patency in one tube and not the other. It doesn't mean that the tube that you're not seeing is not patent. 
um, and uh, you just can't demonstrate it. Uh, but what you can do is either call patency or uh, if there is no fluid, no air going in an, uh, anywhere, then you can uh, call the blockage of the tubes. And this is very consistent uh, in accuracy with the hysterosalpingogram. Um, another thing you can do, uh, here's a patient who's had a prior C-section, and patients with prior C-sections have a lot of um, uh, bleeding because they have this niche uh, in the C-section scar here that collects uh, blood and, uh, and there's a, a, a clot that sits there sometimes. And so um, you put in some fluid and here's the clot, you can see it, and you can flush it out. And then you can really examine the, um, the niche without the clot. And it, this shows you why a lot of patients that have had history, um, uh, cesarean sections uh, have um, these uh, clots that sit in those places and they have intermenstrual bleeding during the month. It's very common for people with uh, cesarean section scars to have, uh, have this, this problem. Now this is probably one of the most remarkable cases I've ever seen uh, last year. 68-year-old patient with abnormal uterine discharge, unresponsive to antibiotics. The only prior history was that she had a bout of diverticulitis six months before. Here's her endometrium, and here we are measuring, trying to measure it. That's not very good. I wouldn't put those uh, measurements in the report, but what is this? Is this calcium? Uh, we were looking at it and it started moving. So then I thought, ah, oh, you know, this must be air. So then I uh, started looking at the, uh, the adnexa, and what do we have here? Uh, Hycosi <laughs> in a 68-year-old. And so there's air in the fallopian tube. So based on this, I actually made the diagnosis of a colon to fallopian tube fistula from diverticulitis, was that, which was actually repaired, and she, she, she was fine. Uh, so uh, fluid in the uh, air in the fallopian tube, very, very helpful uh, to make some of these diagnoses. Now going on to the location of IUDs, we have a lot of IUDs now because we have the morenas that um, uh, de deliver some hormones, and so now they're back in fashion. And 3D is really, really helpful to determine where the IUD is. Uh, patients who have an abnormally placed or slid down IUD have uh, pain and bleeding, and we've documented that so that when you see it, um, you know, there, there's a benefit to replacing, uh, taking it out and replacing. And these IUDs can be hard to find. The shaft of the IUD is pretty obvious here. We couldn't find the arms, and that's because the arms were down instead of up. This was an anchor, this was upside down. I don't know how they got upside down, but whatever it is, that's um, a lot easier to find if you can get a volume and just see the whole thing together. Now here um, is a type of scan where you say, well, it's in the right place. Uh, here's the shaft and here are the arms. Well, the trouble with this is that you don't really know where the endometrium is. Um, and if you do the 3D, you'll see that the right arm is totally embedded uh, in the myometrium, and that's because the uterus is not big enough. And we have found um, and shown data that uh, nulliparous patients don't have a uterus that's big enough uh, to um, support the IUD. And so that's um, uh, the uh, study that we did looking at this uh, led the companies to come up with the Skylar, which is the smaller IUD for people who have a small uterus. Now the last area that I want to get into um, is the Mullerian duct abnormalities. Um, if, again, you have to bring these patients up in the luteal part of the cycle because, again, you're going to use the endometrium as your contrast. Uh, you can put fluid in it, but uh, it's not necessary. I don't do uh, sonohistograms for Mullerian duct abnormalities. You just uh, use the thick uh, endometr endometrium towards like premenstrually, and then you don't have to put in any, any fluid. So here's your uterus, you take your sweep, and here is your coronal view um, that shows you this septum, the subseptum. Um, and the septum, uh, they want to know a lot of times how deep it goes, how thick it is. This is a very thin septum. Um, it wouldn't be good if, if, a, if a pregnancy implanted here because there's not enough blood flow. And this one actually goes all the way down and uh, involves the cervix, too. So this is all very important. And we put a lot of pictures in the, in, in the report uh, for these uh, referring physicians because they are going to take these patients to the OR. Uh, 
And uh, this is better than MRI because you can really manipulate that volume so it's exactly the way you want it, uh, rather than um, you know just um, uh, take the picture the way that, that it comes. Uh, this is an example of uh, why the HSG is not as helpful as just a plain old 3D ultrasound for Mullerians. Uh, this is a septate uterus, and you see the sept septum goes down to here. This is a bicornuate uterus, which is much more rare. Uh, the bicornuates are rare, the septum is very common, and yet with a hysterosapingogram, these would look exactly the same. And yet this does not require treatment, this does require treatment because there's a higher incidence of, um, uh, of miscarriage or early pregnancy loss up to, 80, uh, up to 50% uh, in patients who have uh, a septum. Uh, this is a unicornuate uterus. Interestingly enough, uh, the uterus looks very normal uh, in 2D, and it's only in 3D that you realize that half of it's missing. Uh, a lot of times there's a rudimentary horn. Sometimes it, it connects. Sometimes it doesn't connect here. It's a rudimentary horn that doesn't connect. These are dangerous because if you get pregnant in here, um, it's going to explode, and it, you can't carry the pregnancy in there. Uh, so if you have a rudimentary horn and you're in, in the infertility group, this has to be removed before you go through um, uh, any kind of, of treatment. Um, and so what they do when you have a, a, a septum is that they resect the septum down here, they shave it down, and then they send you back the patient to see what's left. And this is a good repair. They always have a little divot here, um, but that's a good repair of the septum and then the patient can, uh, can try and get pregnant. This is a didelphus. Uh, didelphus is basically two completely separate uteri. It's not two separate cavities in one uterus. That would be a septum. It's two separate uteri, which actually are very hard to image because you have to open your angle 180 degrees in order to catch both sides of the uterus um, in the same picture. Now, we do see infertility patients who have funny, sh unusually shaped uterus. This is a T-shaped uterus. Uh, these are very stiff uteri. Patients with T-shaped uterus are unlikely to get pregnant. Uh, here are two uteri that look very peculiar. I, we, we, I don't know what to call them. That's why I include a picture in the referring physician, for the referring physician, because I, I don't know what, what this is. This is a very, very tubular looking uterus. This one, I don't know whether it's T-shaped or whether it's a bicornuate that fell down. Uh, it, whatever it is, it's not good. And these patients were not uh, getting pregnant. And then, of course, you have patients who have Senechii, who've had multiple DNCs. And unfortunately, when there's a scar like that, uh, you can see it in, in 3D. You don't even have to put any fluid in. So the workup for infertility these days is really one-stop testing. You look at the shape of the uterus inside and out with 3D. You evaluate the cavity with a sonohistogram. You will blow up your balloon just to get a little pressure, um, just to put your air in the tubes or hycosi. And then you look at the ovaries um, and si for signs of endometriosis um, and deep infiltrating endometriosis. And then you, you've really done the whole thing uh, very, very easily in one stop. So the endometrium is a very dynamic portion of the uterus. It changes throughout the cycle. It responds to hormonal changes like a mirror. Um, the endometrial echo is very useful when you do a 3D because you can manipulate it to, be, uh, to uh, make fibroids and polyps stand out. Um, and endometrial cancer is the most common malignancy in the female reproductive tract. Uh, it's less lethal than ovarian cancer, which is why it gets less press, but it is the most common uh, female cancer in, in the pelvis. Thank you very much for your attention.